Well, hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Dwayne Butcher of Lean Frontiers and I'll be your host today. Uh, just a few points of logistics and then a brief bit of context before we begin our session today. We are going to attempt to field questions at the end of our session, so please submit those questions as they arise using the GoToWebinar toolbar that you find on the right side of your screen. If you would submit your questions at the uh, if you would submit your questions at the end of the presentation, there's a chance that we may not get to them. So send your questions in as they arise uh, to make sure we can get them queued up and uh, asked of the presenters. Uh, we are going to record this session. So if you would like to review this information later on demand or also share this with others in your organization, you can watch the recording. So look for a link from me. Uh, within 24 hours after this session ends. Now, a, a bit of context for today's presentation. This is a little outside of the, tr the traditional Lean Frontiers webinar, as there's actually a specific product or a solution that's going to be mentioned periodically. But we're bringing this to you today because, well, actually, as our name kind of indicates, um, Lean Frontiers we're always exploring kind of the new frontiers of good or best business practices. And this discussion today clearly fits that description. You can look at today's presentation in a couple ways. Uh, the, the first and most important lens that I'd like you to look at this through is that what we'll be talking about is a fundamentally different way at looking at a company and a business and their profit. What piqued my interest in this subject is the very fact that it piqued the interest of our presenter that I'll introduce here, Robert Doc Hall. Uh, Doc is one of the original pioneers of lean thinking. I've written the book uh, back in 1982, I think it was, a book called Zero Inventories. It's also one of the founding members of the Association for Manufacturing Excellence. Uh, most recently, he authored a book uh, called Compression, uh, which contends the need for a major shift in business and economic practices to meet some of the challenges that we're facing today. It's uh, using, using a thinking that Doc calls compression thinking. So to, to say that Doc is a visionary would be an understatement. Um, I've always described Doc as someone who's two to three horizons ahead of the rest of us. So as I mentioned, when I found out Doc Doc's interest was piqued on this topic. It piqued my interest. So, Doc, I think that's enough of the accolades for now. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you to uh, kind of walk us through today's presentation. Okay. Thanks, Dwayne. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about QPS, Profit Assurance System. And really just talk about the Bill Adams story, or I'll probably refer to him as Russ. I usually call him Russ. Russ has been working on this about 30 years. Russ was a naval aviator. Russ is a veteran machinist. I don't know, 12,000 hours or more of apprenticeship as a machinist. Uh, ran three or four companies. Uh, a couple of divisions of GE, uh, Evergreen, one of his companies, once won Boeing Supplier of the Year. So uh, Russ is a doer, and if you're going to ask him about QPS, he will begin to talk, and as I like to discuss with Russ, Russ, you ask, somebody asks a simple question, you start, you know, what's the time, and you start explaining how to build the watch. And so when we get to that to the point where some of you are interested, you will find out all you need to know from Russ. So I'm going to whiz through the slides. And, oh, by the way, I don't have a financial interest in Russ's company. This is Russ's baby. He's been developing it for 30 years. And the real interest in it is this is such a different way to think about the relationship between money, finance, and how operations are run. So let's start, I'm gonna fly through the slides. And the purpose of this is just to give you a little overview and maybe convey why you ought to be interested and why I got interested, so. 
starts with targeting your profit. Not revenue, not cost. Target the profit you want to get. It's a specification that's engineered for each order that you take in. <clears throat> and that stack must be mapped for the order to be accepted. You can violate that, but that's the idea. And so what's that do? You're planning your future profit, a target. Russ calls it a planned profit. Then QPS is a system to manage the flow of work through the company. And I mean all the way through from before you take the order in to where it either goes in the whip or you ship it. So if you work the plan, you're going to attain the plan profit. All internal op identify with an order are on one stream that's tracked by QPS. It's not just the shop floor. Key point because this is more than a shop floor system. So what are the key points? Number one, the whole system projects out of a plan profit specification. Management decides the profit they want. They set the target. Once that's done, the system projects outward, and it uses the second bullet point. It's projected in equivalent dollars. We'll come to that again in a minute. If you grasp the idea of equivalent dollars and you're into lean, the rest of it is going to make a sense. That begins with pricing. Third bullet point, the price for each order creates equivalent dollars that match the current operational ability. You're not fudging to yourself. The system tells you we should do this if you're honest with the system. You're going to get capital free profits, what Russ calls it. That means if you use the system and you improve your efficiency, you improve productivity, you're going to have extra capacity. Um, that's where the real bonus comes. Because of this system, you're in a little better strategic and tactical situation. It opens new possibilities to you. But this doesn't do anything for GAAP, you know, generally accepted accounting principles. That's used for external financial reporting. This is strictly an internal system. And last, maybe we'll hear from Bill before this is over. Bill's been working on this about 30 years. He began with a basic version of it. He's worked it up to now where it's got a lot of bells and whistles. And he thought everybody else ought to know something about this. So equivalent dollars. <clears throat> So sometimes we say drill down, you know, to find some detailed cost. Well, in this case, equivalent dollars drill up. They take off from the chart of accounts you have in your own accounting system, and they convert that into equivalent dollars that's tied to the target profit for each order. It takes a while for you to wallow that around in, in your mind. Russ's expression for this is it turns profit upside right. So what are equivalent dollars? Well, there really isn't any such thing as a cost as the cost. The equivalent dollars set up checkpoints for each activity in the flow stream, and you need to hit those in order to attain your planned profit. So you set the planned profit. Now you got checkpoints to hit to actually get that profit. And then all activities that are identified with with a planned path, you might call it a, a routing, a value stream, or something else, but all those activities are on it. It's not limited to the shop floor. And then internally, all financial numbers are expressed in equivalent dollars. So that's a strange language when you first start into it. Equivalent dollars, checkpoints. So if you wrap your head around that, then what does it let you do? Well, the financial numbers, the equivalent dollars, come straight from the current operation. They're telling you, here's where you ought to be for the current operation, and the feedback tells you this is where you are, and it matches the current operation 
In other words, this is not a cost system that's sort of set out as a budget or variances or something else. This is derived straight from what you're doing right now, real time. If you can do that, you don't need accounting variances, at least for a major part of your operation. You may not need much of anything for an operating budget because this is it. And planned profit is scheduled in the backlog. That is, once you've taken in orders with a planned profit attached to them, now you have a pretty good idea, depending on how well you follow this, you have a pretty good idea of what's going to be happening. It's a little less fog in your forecast. This is a very oh, sketchy idea how the thing works. So you can see on the left of the screen, orders in. They've been pre-screened a little bit at that point because people selling stuff, your marketing people or your sales engineers or whoever they are, also have access to this. And it's kind of a guide, you know, if, if I'm trying to bring in an order that's way outside of something we can do, let's, let, let's don't bother with that. And so the, the, the funnel of bringing in orders can start pretty early. And then there's a decision point, pending orders, do we accept that order? And then up the top box, there's a profit coordinator. That's a key function. Accept, rejects the orders. Once it's accepted, it's scheduled, and in Russ's system, that's done by the profit model, and then profit scheduling, and then next block over, block scheduling. Russ will, will block the orders into fairly equivalent dollar or equivalent time lengths. In other words, the system does its best to set up your work so it flows. Um, you can run this in simulation mode, or you can just look at what you're scheduling. And if you're thinking about this once you're into the system, you can anticipate problems before they happen. And one little phrase there is price to the planned profit. That you can have tremendous improvement in your efficiency and then somebody gives it away in the way you price. And finally, the profit assurance system, you know, real-time monitoring, the system flags problems. If you've got sharp people on the shop floor, most of them are, they may know a lot of things that are happening before it, 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 it triggers in the system. But as soon as somebody enters something in the system and you're a little behind or things aren't going well, it goes yellow, it goes red, and then from anywhere you're monitoring this, you know something out there needs attention. Um, the real-time part of this is, is very important and reality. The system's set up to be hard to gameplay. Once an order closes, nobody can access it. There's no changes. No job loading after the fact. It's hard to fudge the numbers. You can't go on to the next order while the last one's still open. Because of that, in a company that runs this way, everything is recorded in, quote, indelible ink. It may be messed up. Somebody can fix that. But what's done is done, and it shows on the screen, and that's it. It tends to improve transparency because once people get used to it and they begin to trust the numbers, the attitudes change. It isn't you know, what I know or what you don't know or I'm doing better than you or something else. It's a lot more from me to us or we. Then you have an incentive to eliminate waste. All those flags are the sore spots. Uh, it does keep extra work. I don't know of a company that doesn't make mistakes. I've made several already this morning, and I'm not even in a plant. And so depending on how many errors you are making or what your capability is, you keep some inventory, some extra work. Russ calls this the protect number. 
protect number in the system obviously adds to the cost as structured by the system. Russ sometimes calls them your backroom standards. You get better and better, your protect number might go down. And the sore spots in this uh, you know, really flag and they demand attention. Uh, and since it's real time, you may get attention sooner. Some of them can be identified. You fix a problem before they happen. And the nice little feature is you measure that protect number. You can track it. Are you gaining or slipping? Uh, profit control coordination. <clears throat> there may be a person or maybe more than one person with a job profit control coordinator, but it's part of the system. So what does it do? First, it checks whether incoming orders meet the parameters. Can we do this? Uh, I've known Russ now several years. He has some very colorful expressions for marketing people or CEOs that bring in work that the shop really struggles to make. You know, so he used to put it, you get a great big order, it's a little hard to do, and he'd groan. He was the operating guy. He had to actually fulfill the order. Next question, are orders priced to meet the plan and profit? It's a guide to pricing. You're not fudging around playing or playing as many games. If you've got a really good customer like a Boeing or a major OEM with people that begin to dig what this is, you just tell them, we need to make some money out of this, and here's what it's going to be, and we are getting better. And so uh, we can do things other companies can't do, et cetera, et cetera. You're in a better position to actually talk your customer into saying, here's the price. It's one that allows us to make a fair profit, et cetera. Now, the orders that are accepted are box scheduled. No gaps between the box, the schedules of block. So that sets up work to flow better. If you think about this, you are moving work through the company and through the factory, and it's sort of like the profit numbers, the equivalent dollars are just sort of a floater on top of that. You're scheduling the profit. And all that's the key to making planned profit real or making it work. I think most of you on the call are into Kaizen, into process improvement, continuous improvement, whatever you call it. So the system certainly encourages that. Uh, I just labeled this a profit coordination circle. How does it work? Well, in that first quadrant, by the Deming Circle, ordinarily called plan. What you're doing is for this. And then you start to work the system and you see the profit constraints. You may do them in simulation mode ahead of time. You may be seeing them as they happen. You see the constraints. So what do you do? Eyes in. You know, fix the problem as they happen. They may be minor. They may be more major. But this is sort of a Kaizen generator, and then you reset the system parameters. As as your costs are updated, every time you update them, every time you make a change, your actual cost, as reflected in your own chart of accounts, gets built into the parameters of the system. And so as things change, improve, you reset to current reality for cost and for what you can actually do. And you go again. This is not an occasional thing. The wheel's spinning all the time. Every time you update, every time you schedule, something is changing and it prompts you to go see something and fix it. So anticipate problems. You can run in simulator mode. You can see sore spots. You can take it out as a simulator mode. You can you know, anticipate what you're going to do if you change some equipment, change some technology, blah, blah, and anticipate how things might actually operate doing that. Or to prepare this week to run next week or this year to run next year. 
and being able to see problems in advance is a pretty fair advantage. Fewer surprises. They don't make them go away, but fewer of them. Russ calls this capital-free profit. To do this, you don't really need to spend much. Uh, your profit is, the big gain is from releasing capacity that you no longer need because you can get more done with the same people and the same equipment. So that means you release capacity. And incidentally, the system is on the cloud. And if you don't lead a lot of IT to otherwise track costs and whatever, your IT costs may actually go down with this. And it's affordable. Uh, Russ can tell you about costs. I'm not going to. But when I've talked with him, the average small to medium-sized company can afford this it's not a one to two hundred thousand dollar ERP system. Um, since you can increase capacity with essentially that opens uh, or releases capacity. That last bullet point to get a big gain out of this, you need to fill that capacity, and Russ called that infill sales the system will begin to tell you ahead of time that this capacity is going to release and you need to be going for infill sales. And if you're smart, you'll structure your infill sales by plan profit and don't just grab anything. I've seen a number of companies go through lean and they opened up their capacity and the huge problem was not knowing when it was going to open, not starting soon enough on this problem, not getting marketing on board with what was happening. And probably the biggest one, they couldn't get work without going outside of the, the ordinary channels or set of customers they, they already had. If they needed to do something that was a major marketing deal for them, that was a bigger risk than changing the operation. And so key point, in-field sales aren't just anything you can pick up to build the capacity. You get a little more advanced with this, you can price based on the learning curve Russ has. And if you can anticipate from past performance what your learning curve is likely to be, you can adjust the plan profit and the price to accommodate that. And if you're a little ahead of the competition doing it, you, you have an edge. Now, as you all know, uh, if you can keep everybody working, you sustain the current employees, and that's been a big nemesis of lean since I've known about it, sometimes in Japan as well as here. You couldn't do that. In the end, you wind up uh, dismissing people and the, the morale goes down and they don't want any more to do with this system because all they're doing is working themselves out of a job, blah, blah. Uh, <clears throat> third bullet point down. Uh, sales and marketing can use this. Uh, without QPS, I've known several companies where on a laptop that they would take to a customer, they can design a product or an order or something with them, know immediately if they can make it. And in many cases, check a schedule and see, we can make it and here's when we deliver. And that's been going on for, I don't know, 10, 15 years or more with at least a few companies. And the companies that do it have had a pretty good sized advantage because a customer will come back if you tell them, yes, we can make it, and here's when we can deliver it. And if you as a salesperson right on their premises can tell them that, well, good for you. Um, you can use the system as a simulator once you're really into it. You can make changes and see how your plant might run differently with it or how the 
more correctly, you can see how your old company may run better with it. Now, all that put together opens up strategy to you. This thing is different. The equivalent dollars may turn you upside down at first. But once into it, you have a strategic advantage. That is, managers can spend more time thinking about the future, what they want to go to. Uh, this system, it doesn't slice bread. It doesn't tell you if your technology is getting out of date. It doesn't tell you how your customers may change. It may not forecast the next economic boom or bust, all those things. There's still a lot for management to think about. And they ought to have a much better tool to help them think about it. The top line there is is underlined. The system itself lets you negotiate knowledgeably with customers. That is, if you have a firm idea what you can and can't do, then you might walk away from the negotiation. On the other hand, you may go back and forth a little bit with a customer. You know, if you just did this and this, we could do it and it'd cost you, it'd cost you less. That's an important advantage in a lot of businesses. You can factor your learning curve in. We talked about that. Since you have a backlog coming in that you've already pretty well assured you can make, uh, that's a, l a little more credibility with a lender. Yeah, we've got this work lined up. We know we can do it, and here's the profit we're going to get from it. That's a plus. Uh, by the way, going all the way back to Toyota years ago, this is a side. Something people didn't understand about Toyota's domestic operation was that they were very different in the way they sold cars. A month to six weeks in advance, they would have a commitment from a customer that they were going to buy a car. The specifications may not be completely set, but a name was on a dotted line, and this was an order. And so the first four to six weeks of a schedule coming into an assembly plant, they wouldn't even call a sales forecast. This was a sales commitment. And the closer you can get to running a company so you can get to that point, the better off you are. That was a chunk of why Toyota was so successful in Japan and is a part that's kind of unsung. The next to last bullet point, oh, gain sharing. All kinds of gain sharing plans. What you do is up to you. It may be helpful if employees share in the benefit of this. In fact, it doubtlessly would be. And how you set that up exactly is up to you. And gain sharing in itself is a whole big other thing. Uh, there was a... a group just called the Scanlon Leader Network that's still sort of going. And their whole thing was, in the beginning, was gain sharing and working with senior managers until they understood that if you really went into gain sharing, it had to be credible. Therefore, this was a company-wide change if you weren't in a great position to do it. That's just one little aspect of culture change and Russ and I propose that we ought to talk more about the culture change stuff in our follow-on webinar. Next to the last bullet point on that, uh, BS administrative work. Uh, personal example, I have a daughter that I call Miss Spreadsheet. She's dealt with HR and cost systems ever since she's been at work, and she would describe about three-fourths of what she does as BS administrative work. If you just had a good system, you wouldn't need that. And this system helps a company learn to almost run itself. So I don't know what the potential is in that, but in the right company, it's big. In fact, it's big enough that you may have a problem figuring out what you do with the people that are relieved 
of BS administrative work. The last point, it really encourages a stability of the workforce. That's a huge problem in a lot of industries today. Getting people with the skills, that's where the attention is, but the stability and developing people and giving them the time and the, uh, and the prompts to actually think on the job really makes a company much better. It, it's an aspect of this that I think has tremendous promise. Um, next one. Well, I guess that was the last one. So we've whizzed three slides. Uh, I know it was a quick trip, and, and your head may be buzzing a little bit now, so we'd be open for questions and introduce Russ, and he can give war stories. Uh, one point, going back through that, Russ has several war stories, and I can generalize them. Russ got along pretty well with everybody who's doing real work. Every place he went after a year or two, the profitability would be getting better, but he wasn't following the rules. He was in trouble with senior management because he wasn't doing exactly what they thought ought to be done the way they thought it ought to be done. And so this is Russ' gift to the world, so to speak. Uh, we will have another webinar August 24th, Developing a Culture. Probably have a third webinar for people interested. And I said we'd be open for questions. So, Dwayne, we got questions? So, Doc, uh, the only question that came in was, is QPS a software? Uh, and that is the only question that's come in. Uh... Well, it's a good question. Yes, it's software. Um, just like a production schedule, software, yeah. But if you're uh, if you're trying to run by this, it really is much more of a a people-centered system. So, yeah, it. it it revolves around the software, but I think, well, say it differently, if you think there's software magic that's going to resolve your problems, this isn't for you. If you would like a system with a different kind of thinking, it may revolutionize your company, let's keep digging. Hmm. That's a great way to frame it up, Doc. Um, I'm not. Another question just came in: Are are capital expenses considered? And I'm not sure uh, if Bill, you need to step in on any of this. Just chime in. Well, go, going back to that 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 first question, um, it's a combination of a financial model, what's called the profit model. The software is actually on the cloud and that is called profit scheduling and then there's a thing called tomorrow today where it looks to the front of the company and sees the profit picture puzzle before it happens and then the profit assurance system assures that when they take an order they can do it so it's, it's a combination of four tools Follow up from that. This don't make, this does not make strategic decisions for you, but it's a helpful guide. If if you're out looking for work and you can't find something you can do, you got a problem. It's not going to tell you what you need to do to change your technology or something, or it, it may it may be suggesting to you that you're in a dying industry or something. You need to really do something strategically different. It won't do that. It it will. It does give you a lot of parameters about your operation that will help guide you into those kinds of issues. To answer your question about capital equipment, our focus is around what we call capital-free profit. We're looking at your existing company, your existing troops, your existing facility, uh, your existing equipment, 
and producing more planned engineered specified profits. This profit is a specification, is an engineered specification, and that is our focus. You, you don't purchase any new capital equipment. Oh, and to the issue of the Intel sales, uh, companies that did that the quickest typically brought in work that they had previously outsourced. And, you know, a lot of issues around that. But it is one way to at least start doing it. So I'm not sure. My if this sense is a... of it is everybody. Everybody's kind of blown away by this. Don't know quite what question to ask. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a question or just a, a point this person's making. But uh, you put down existing companies also require change of equipment. The, the answer to that is you, you you need no new equipment. You need no new I two I T support. Uh, it 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 operates in your existing company parameters. Well, if if the questioner want to know what happened, if you're already in the process of changing your equipment, yes, you can build that in. What about depreciation of expenses? Uh, that that's all worked into the into the profit model profit model so so that's that's in there if, if, if you if you do it now it works into the profit model the profit model takes from your chart of accounts your standard gap and transitions it into time-driven activity based profiting which then feeds into operations with the information so for the first time operations is running on looking at real equivalent dollars by activity real time okay the questioner says thanks for thanks for the answers you bet uh, that is all the questions that have uh, come in so doc I think you're right uh, there's some spinning heads out there well your head spinning and you want to talk to Bill my my experience with Bill is you ask him a question uh, just stand back and be ready to hear it he's happy to talk about this with anybody interested he'll take you on a ride through the system now you get down in the weeds and look at the screens and you know here's here's how the thing really works So I'd invite you to do that. I did that a couple, three times with Bill, and two or three times while he was trying to put his final bells and whistles on this. So uh, if you're curious, why well, email Bill or give him a ring, and I think he'd be delighted to talk to anybody. Yeah, another another question just came in asking. I think what you're just saying there, uh, some, somebody's asking for a demo. If we have a be, demo. We have a live demo that we can take him to the cloud and and take them through this. Yeah. So you've got Bill's contact thing, information there. Uh, feel free to. What this thing does, gentlemen, is it determines your plan, engineered profit specification before the fact, and then it schedules that and it attaches the plant capacity to that to support it. That's what it does. It schedules. Prop, plan profit, not not parts. Okay. So uh, I guess then we, we've got our uh, next marching orders here for August 24th. And we'll try to get some details around exactly what we'll be talking about then and uh, get that out to everyone so you can get registered for the next next installment of our discussion here. So, Doc, and uh, and Bill, thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.
we're about reshoring American manufacturing. This is for American manufacturing only. Okay. Hey, thank hey, you very much. Bye-bye.